In 2019, a video circulated widely on social media making the claim, quote, a ban prohibiting the practice of the ancient Sri Lankan martial art Angampora has been lifted. Fighters will now be able to openly practice their art for the first time since 1817, end quote. The video's claim appears to be supported by Wikipedia's article on Angampora, which says, quote, the British, who occupied the whole island by 1815 and who had full control of it by 1818, issued a gazette banning the practice in 1817 with harsh punishments for flouters, paving the way to its decline. This was because the British forces found it difficult to face the Sri Lankan revolutionaries who were practitioners of this art. End quote. However, the only reference provided in support of this claim is a link to a non-scholarly newspaper article which does not cite any sources. Although the source cited in the Wikipedia article refers to a British gazette banning Angapura in 1817, this news article dates the ban to 1818. The discrepancy is minor, but the lack of detail encourages further investigation. Meanwhile, a Sri Lankan blog article on a different site says Angapura was used successfully in an uprising in 1818 and was then banned by a British gazette in 1827. According to one Sri Lankan news source, Air Marshal Kapila Jayampathi, commander of the Sri Lanka Air Force, recently requested the President of Sri Lanka to lift the ban on Angapura, to which the President agreed. The Sri Lankan government website has made note of this, also making the claim of a ban on Angapura in 1818. This would seem to give credence to the claim that the martial art was banned and that it was banned in 1818. There is clearly a long-standing belief that the British banned Angapura in the 19th century, but the exact date and circumstances under which this took place are obviously inconsistently reported. The years 1817, 1818 and 1827 have all been cited, with the Sri Lankan government itself regarding 1818 as the correct date. In 2017, an article by Edvard Schaeffer in the Journal of Physical Culture and Sport Studies and Research made the claim in a more scholarly context. Schaeffer is a self-described engineer with a master's degree in engineering who also wrote a PhD thesis on Bunkai, the analysis and practical art of kata, the training exercises used in karate and other Japanese martial arts. Schaeffer's article makes the claim that, quote, after the British occupied the whole island of Sri Lanka in 1815, they banned the practice of Angapura in 1817. They burned down all of the practice huts they found and shot anyone found practicing this art in the knee, end quote. However, Schaeffer does not cite any sources for this claim, and his article's bibliography does not reference any works at all on Angapura. Commentary in Historical Sources The Sri Lankan blog Tales of Ceylon dates the ban a year later, to 1818, and provides additional information claiming it was enacted by British Governor Robert Brownrigg. This provides a useful historical lead to follow. Brownrigg oversaw the suppression of various rebellions in Sri Lanka, called Ceylon at the time, and his tenure as governor of Ceylon is well documented. Additionally, he is known specifically for a proclamation he made in the Ceylon Government Gazette number 851 on the 1st of January 1818, in which he declared 19 Sri Lankans as criminals for their involvement in the Uva Walasa Great Rebellion of 1817-1818. Brownrigg's suppression of the rebellion was brutal, and in the province of Uva, all males over the 18 were murdered. A British historical work entitled Manual of the Province of Uva, published in 1893, describes the rebellion and its aftermath in brief but grim terms, noting that after the rebellion had been suppressed, quote, there was a general air of misery and desolation on the face of the country, end quote. Several British historical sources document the rebellion and its suppression, and Brownrigg's proclamation in the Ceylon Government Gazette of 1818 is cited and quoted. However, none of these sources say anything about Brownrigg banning Angapura. The historical website A People's History 1793 to 1844 from the newspapers contains a wealth of historical newspaper articles from all over the world. Of particular use in this case, is its extensive quotation from the Ceylon Government Gazette. Although the Gazette issues for 1816 and 1817 are missing, 
The website quotes the Gazette's commentary on the rebellion in 1818. This source is particularly useful since it quotes from the Gazette issues of several months in 1818. The record is incomplete, so it is not possible to check every issue for every month in 1818 to see if there was a proclamation banning Angapura. Consequently, the fact that Angapura is not mentioned in any of the Gazette records quoted for 1818 is not conclusive evidence against the idea that Brownrigg issued a Gazette proclamation banning it. Nevertheless, the information it does provide certainly makes it unlikely that the British banned Angapura because they felt threatened by this martial art. The proclamation for the 14th of February describes the difficulties the British army has in fighting against the provincial leader of the rebellion. However, it makes no mention of any danger from martial arts, saying instead, quote, Our army is acting against him, but the terrain is unsuitable for artillery, and he moves much more quickly than we can, end quote. The proclamation for the 18th of April is even more significant. This time it notes, quote, The difficulty is that the rebels have the support of the people, end quote, and indicates that the British forces are heavily outnumbered. However, it then goes on to say, quote, Fortunately, they are not skilled in war and use spears and arrows to fight against us. Only a few of our chaps have been hurt, end quote. This is important for three reasons. Firstly, if Angapura was so dangerous to the British that they felt the need to ban it after the rebellion, it is highly surprising that it is never cited as a threat even when they specifically describe difficulties encountered when fighting the Sri Lankans. Secondly, the fact that the proclamation says explicitly that the Sri Lankan forces, quote, use spears and arrows to fight against us, end quote, suggests that Angampura was used, but that the British simply didn't take notice of it specifically. Strictly speaking, the term Angampura refers specifically to a form of unarmed combat, with other terms used to describe the Sri Lankan forms of combat with weapons. But Angampura is also used as an umbrella term for both the traditional Sri Lankan unarmed martial art and for the forms of martial art which incorporated various weapons such as staves, daggers, swords, spears and a special kind of metal whip. It is certainly clear that if the Sri Lankans were using Angampura, the British either didn't realise they were being confronted by a deadly martial art or didn't consider it sufficiently significant to even mention. This certainly contradicts the idea that they saw it as particularly dangerous. Thirdly, the fact that the record indicates the British considered the Sri Lankan weapons to be an insignificant threat, resulting in few casualties, makes it unlikely that the British felt in any way threatened by Sri Lankan soldiers using Angampura, either with or without weapons. In fact, the record is particularly dismissive of the Sri Lankan soldiers, saying, quote, they are not skilled in war. End quote. This is quite the opposite of the language we would expect if the British felt threatened by Angampura. On the 21st of November 1818, Brownrigg issued a lengthy proclamation of 12 pages containing 56 detailed clauses describing various laws to be enacted in response to the rebellion. However, there is no mention of Angampura at all. Commentary in other sources. Curiously, it's extremely difficult to find any information on this ban in published books or scholarly articles. Additionally, it seems there are very few independent sources, with most copying the same phrasing found in numerous online articles. The earliest online reference to the ban seems to be an electronic reproduction of an article from the Sri Lankan Daily Mirror's Sports Weekly magazine. The original article was published on the 17th of September 2004, and was posted on the website livingheritage.org on the 4th of November 2004. The article contains the basic information found in numerous sources which date after 2004, claiming the British banned Angampura in 1817 after a rebellion, and that anyone breaking the ban was shot below the knee. Not only does this seem to be the earliest online reference to the ban, it also seems to be the earliest reference to the penalty of being shot below the knee, which is found in subsequent sources. Thus far, the meme seems to be historically unsubstantiated, if not entirely debunked. However, it does seem strange that it is so widely disseminated, and even though the details differ in various aspects from source to source, there does seem to be a reasonably consistent agreement that Angampura was banned by the British 
during 1817 or 1818 under the governorship of Robert Brownrigg. Consequently, although historical evidence for the man is lacking, it still has the appearance of being based on some kind of historical event. On the 10th of March 2019, an article in the Sri Lankan Sunday Observer presented a typical summary of the account of the Angampura ban, dating it to 1818 as a response to the Uva Walesa rebellion, attributing it to Governor Robert Brownrigg, claiming it was because, quote, Angampura managed to inflict pain and death on the invading British, end quote, and repeating the assertion that practitioners were shot in the knee. However, the article also provides some additional information which isn't part of the usual story, claiming that instead of being eradicated, Angampura continued to be taught secretly and, quote, was taught by two main clans, Sudalia and Maruwalia, end quote. Alleged evidence in a historical document. Following up this reference to the two clans leads to an article published on the 19th of June 2008 by photographer and film producer Reza Akram on the website Behance.net. Akram repeats the claim that Angampura, quote, was outlawed and systematically driven to decline after 1818, exactly 200 years ago, by the British, end quote. However, most importantly, Akram's article includes a photograph of a historical document which he describes as containing the actual text of the ban. Under this photo, he attributes the ban to Governor Robert Brownrigg and states explicitly that it was directed against, quote, the Sudalia and Maruwalia Angam lineages who were responsible for training the king's armies, end quote. Finally, we have a historical document relevant to the claim of the ban on Angampura. However, a close reading of the document reveals that it does not match Akram's claim directly. The document is a 19th century text, handwritten in a cursive style, but the size of Akram's photograph makes it quite readable. The relevant section of the text says, quote, that the office of Sudalia Mohandiram and Maruwalia Mohandiram are unnecessary and may be abolished, the people of those departments being assigned to the Naha Wasme, end quote. In the text, there is an asterisk beside the names of the officers, and a marginal note clarifies that these are, quote, chiefs of gladiators, end quote. This is a remarkably short statement for a supposedly influential ban on Angampura. Additionally, it doesn't even mention Angampura, nor does it say Angampura is banned, nor does it mention any penalty for teaching Angampura. Akram's description of this text is at least partially correct. He says, quote, the order by Governor Robert Brownrigg was executed by John Doyley, effectively cracking down on the Sudalia and Marawalia Angam lineages who were responsible for training the king's armies, end quote. However, what does this actually mean? How does Akram derive a ban on Angampura from this text? The answer lies in the meaning of the marginal note, which clarifies that the two officers which are to be abolished are the chiefs of gladiators. Akram notes that these are also references to two different clans which taught Angampura. He has concluded from this text that the Governor Brownrigg's abolition of the officers of these two clan leaders, who were chiefs of gladiators, constitutes a ban on Angampura. But to what extent is this a valid conclusion? The position of Mohandiram, typically written today in English as Muhandiram, was actually introduced by the Portuguese during their colonization of Ceylon in the 17th century. These positions were granted to the leaders of tribes and clans, making them responsible for certain administrative functions. By the time of the British occupation of Ceylon in the 19th century, this system was very well established and was consequently adopted by the British colonial government. So what does the document mean when it says the Sudalia Muhandiram and Maruwalia Muhandiram were chiefs of gladiators, and that their positions would now be abolished. The term chiefs of gladiators indicates that the men in these two positions, from two different clans, were responsible for training Sri Lankan soldiers. Akram rightly says that they would have been responsible for training them specifically in the art of Angapura. From this, Akram derives the conclusion that the British abolition of these two positions was a complete ban on anyone being taught Angapura. We might object that the text doesn't actually talk about such an absolute ban, 
but it does seem Akram is on reasonably firm ground to infer that this was the intention of the abolition of these two positions. This seems like a reasonable conclusion, but it is contradicted by two lines of historical evidence. Ironically, one of them is in the very document Akram cites. Let's look at it again. The text says that the two administrative positions of Sudalia Mohandiram and Maruwalia Mohandiram are considered unnecessary and may be abolished. Given that these two positions were responsible for training Sri Lankan soldiers in the art of Angampura, the word unnecessary is a very odd word to use if the British actually felt so threatened by Angampura that they wanted to stamp it out. We might expect a more relevant word describing the position of these two men as seditious, or at least dangerous, or some other term indicating that they were being abolished out of fear of a martial threat which could encourage or support a rebellion. The term unnecessary is so incredibly dismissive that it gives quite the opposite impression, as if these two positions are now deemed irrelevant. Of course, we might infer that they were considered irrelevant, and that the reason for this was a ban on Angampura. However, apart from the fact that the text does not say this, the text actually contains evidence that Angampura would continue to be taught. Let's look at it again. It clearly says that the positions of the chiefs of gladiators would be abolished, but it also says, quote, the people of those departments being assigned to the Naha Wasme, end quote. So these chiefs of gladiators were indeed administrative officials equivalent to heads of departments, and although their positions are being abolished, the people under them are simply being reassigned to a different department. There is no hint that the people assisting these two officials are also being disbanded or their work abolished. Still, we could infer that the transfer of the staff under these officials was intended to stamp out the teaching of Angapura. However, in the very next paragraph of the document, we find evidence against this. The next paragraph contains almost identical wording, saying, quote, that the office of Kotralbade Nilame is unnecessary and may be abolished, the people of that department remaining under the orders of their headman only and of the revenue agent. End quote. In this case, there is an asterisk beside the title Kotobade Nilame, and a marginal note explains that this position is, quote, chief of artificers, end quote. This was the officer in charge of the palace craftsmen. Again, it is noteworthy that although this administrative position is being abolished, the text states explicitly that the Department of Craftsmen itself and all the people working under it will continue to work under the leadership of their clan headman and the revenue agent who was possibly British. This is significant because although the palace craftsmen were mainly carpenters, painters, stonemasons and jewellers, a number of them were blacksmiths and other metal workers who were specifically responsible for making traditional Sri Lankan weapons as well as modern British firearms. Clearly, the British saw no danger in allowing the palace craftsmen to continue their work of making weapons, and the only change made was the abolition of an administrative appointment resulting in a slight change of leadership. For the palace craftsmen, only the head of their department was changed, while their regular work continued. From this, it is clear that the document cited by Reza Akram is not speaking of any ban on Angampura, but of mundane governmental and administrative changes, which typically involved streamlining departments by abolishing unnecessary leaders and shuffling staff. Historical evidence contrary to the ban claim. There is additional historical information indicating that Akram's interpretation of this document is inaccurate. In a book published in 1821, entitled An Account of the Interior of Ceylon and Its Inhabitants, English chemist John Davy, brother of the much more famous chemist Sir Humphrey Davy, wrote a historical account of the history of Ceylon, as it was then called, while he was stationed there as a member of the army's medical staff from 1816 to 1820. Consequently, he was both an eyewitness and historian of the events of the Uva Walesa uprising, its brutal suppression by the British, and the various government proclamations and rulings which were enacted subsequently. Very importantly, Davy identifies the role of these chiefs of gladiators, explains the historical function, and describes the actual reason for their abolition. The relevant information is found in a chapter entitled Old Form of Government, 
in which he describes the changes of government enforced by the British after the suppression of the Uva Walesa uprising. On page 138, he starts a list of, quote, officers of the palace, end quote. Within this long list, he lists the Sudalia Muhandiram and Murawalia Muhandiram as positions which existed as officers of the palace under the old form of government. This is extremely significant. It reveals that these two chiefs of gladiators were in fact only responsible for training the soldiers at the royal palace. They were not the only teachers of Angampora, and they actually only taught a very small number of soldiers. Very usefully, Davies' historical account explains why they were called the chiefs of gladiators. On pages 155 and 156, he explains that the terms he explains that the terms Sudalia and Maruwalia refer to ethnic or clan divisions within the Sri Lankan people themselves, adding that these two chiefs of gladiators both, quote, commanded a class of fences, one called Sudalia and the other Muruwalia, end quote. This confirms that these chiefs of gladiators were only responsible for training Angopora warriors in the palace. Additionally, Davy provides an explanation for the use of the term gladiators. The actual role of the chiefs of gladiators was to train soldiers in the art of Angampura in order to fight with each other in single combat for the entertainment of the king and his court. Davy says, quote, their engagements were single combats, either with the fist or with sword and shield or with clubs, end quote. Adding, quote, formally they exhibited before the court like gladiators, endeavouring to draw blood and inflict wounds. End quote. So these chiefs of gladiators, who were to be abolished, were only training Sri Lankan soldiers in Angampora for the benefit of the king and his court. They were not training men for the army, nor were they training the average civilian. Consequently, the abolition of their position only affected the king and his court. Most importantly, Davy provides the reason why the chiefs of gladiators were abolished. It was because the British government decided to end the custom of Angambora warriors fighting for the entertainment of the royalty and social elites at the palace, since it led to fights between the two clans led by the two opposing chiefs of gladiators. Davy writes, quote, The bloody combat was discontinued as it gave rise to serious quarrels and feuds amongst the people. End quote. It is now clear why the chiefs of gladiators were abolished. It was not because the British feared the danger of Angapura as a martial art. In fact, there is no evidence that they even identified it as a specific martial tradition. Nor was it because the British feared the danger of a Sri Lankan army well trained in Angapura. In fact, their casual dismissal of the weapons of the Sri Lankan warriors makes it clear they considered them an insignificant threat. Instead, the abolition of the chiefs of gladiators was explicitly because the gladiatorial style combat between two warriors of opposing clans repeatedly caused civil unrest and fighting between those two clans. So Reza Akram's interpretation of the historical document he cites is inaccurate. The document does not contain any reference to a ban on Angampora, and the abolition of administrative positions it does describe was intended to affect, very specifically, the gladiatorial combat which took place at the palace. There is no evidence that it was ever intended to constitute or encourage a general ban on Angapura, which is not even mentioned in the text. Significantly, there is no mention of any penalty for anyone teaching Angapura, and certainly no mention of a threat of being shot in the knee for attempting to learn it. One additional item of information provided by Davies' historical record is completely incompatible with the claim that Angapura was banned in 1818. After explaining the reason for the abolition of the gladiatorial combat at the palace, Davy makes it clear that on both the Sudalia and Maruwalia sides, other teachers of Angampura existed all through the country. He writes, quote, Of each set of fences, that is, on both the Sudalia and Maruwalia sides, there were ten maitradams, that is, masters of combat, in different parts of the country to give lessons to all who wished to learn their art. End quote. So, even after the positions of the chiefs of gladiators were abolished, there were still plenty of Angapura masters all through the country, continuing to teach the art to anyone interested. Davy never mentions any kind of restriction on this teaching, 
nor any penalties inflicted for people seeking to learn it. Conclusion It appears there is no historical support for the claim that Angapura was ever banned by the British. Perhaps there is some evidence somewhere, but it is remarkable that virtually no source making the claim ever provides any evidence for it, and it is even more remarkable that the only historical document which is cited as evidence does not support this interpretation. So how did this story even get started? Well, the case of the mysterious ban on Angapura is not unique. Historically, nationalist groups seeking to revive interest in ethnic heritage and raise patriotic fervor have made false claims of colonial era bans or restrictions on cultural practices. As an example, the claim that the British banned, persecuted, and even executed Indian practitioners of yoga is not historically accurate, but has had the effect of raising awareness of yoga and encouraging more people to participate in it while also firing up national pride. The sudden appearance of references to the Angapura ban in 2004 followed by its ceremonial removal by the government in 2019, suggests strongly that this entire story was based on a misunderstanding of a historical source, which was later amplified by nationalistic fervor and an over-enthusiastic attempt to reconstruct and revive an ancient cultural practice. In many ways, this is a typical chapter in the history of post-colonial nations. It is also a very typical event in the process of decolonization, which often involves reconstructing or simply reinventing national and cultural history to serve the new needs and goals of contemporary generations. <laughs>